Let's all stand and get ready to rejoice. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we give you thanks, God, for gathering us here this evening, Lord. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. That we have this ability, God, to worship, Lord, to worship your name and all that you are, God, and all that you do for us. So we give you thanks and glory, God, and praise this night. And we pray that you would bless this, Lord. That this offering would be worthy, God. That our praise would be worthy, Lord. That it would be true, that it would be just. Give you praise, Lord, that your word, Lord, that you go out, God, and never touch hearts as well. Your mighty word, God. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow.
Old things hard past away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains a cornerstone. Things that we
Calvary Chapel, England. Glad you're all here tonight. My first Wednesday since I've been back, right? Yeah. 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 I just got back Saturday from Africa, so get back in the swing of things. A couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, those of you that would like to participate in passing out flyers or tracks to the community for our Harvest Carnival, which is tomorrow night at 5 to about 8 or 9, it all depends on the crowd. We've got flyers in the back there if you want to take some. And we've got tons of these little little tracks with our map and so forth on the back. A good place to hand these out is, is by the high school. So you go there right when they're leaving, leaving school. And as long as you're on the sidewalk, you're okay because that's public. You can't go on the school grounds, but you can go on the sidewalk and just stand there and just hold them out. And if they take them, they take them. If they don't, that's fine too, but usually they just take them, they want to see what it is. Now, 
because they're kids, they'll just throw them on the ground. And <laughs> so you have to go and pick them, pick them up, because we don't want to leave a mess there. So just something that you might want to want to do. Um, also, we need help uh, after service to get all these chairs out, so we can be ready for tomorrow's event. All right. So um, let me see what's going on. Uh, nothing going on this week. We have a men's conference. November 9th. So if you're interested, please see me. I believe it's free uh, as far as I know. Um, you'll just have to bring some money for a meal there if they have food. Um, but that's about it. So we'll carpool to the event so we know, uh, you know exactly why, who, and who, and where, and what will be going so that we can uh, set all of that up. All right, the discipleship meeting is next Monday, this coming Monday at 6.30 here at the church. Other than that, that's it. Let's go ahead and, oh, and the youth. Thank you, Carlos. Carlos gave me the motion. <laughs> so youth was supposed to be this coming Friday, but it's been changed to November 8th, which is the following Friday at 6.30 still, right? Yeah. So if you're a youth, you're invited. If you know the youth, invite them to come on out. All right, let's pray. Precious Lord, uh, it's just heavy on my heart right now, Lord, as it is with so many others, Lord, as we've seen this fire just consume uh, the hill over here off of Pyrite and yes, Lord. of Headley, Lord, and in many other places too, Father. We just want to lift up the residents to you, Lord, and Lord, the opportunity for your people, Lord, to, to be a witness, Father, to share through this horrible time for some of the residents, Lord, as it seemed like it got pretty close to some homes, Lord, and there might be some damage to property, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you use this for your glory, you turn it around, Father, with the enemy meant for evil, Lord, and that people would come to know your, your son, Jesus Christ, Lord. It does remind me, Lord, of the fire that is coming one day. And Lord, we need to share about that fire that's going to consume eternally, Lord, not consume them to death, but consume them eternally, Father, where there is pain and suffering, Lord. And Lord, our hearts are ache for those that are unsaved, yes. that don't know, those even that are arrogant and are rebellious against you, and have even hatred towards Christianity, Lord. We pray for their souls, Lord. We thank you for this rap artist, Lord God, that has come out and said he is a believer, Lord, time will always tell those things, Lord, but at this moment, Father, people are taking notice, and Christ is being lifted up. And so even if it's for the wrong motives, Lord, Christ is being lifted up, and hopefully, Lord, many youth will come to know Jesus Christ as their own, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your precious word, Lord. Your, words, your word means so much to me, Lord. See, I can't govern my own life. I don't know what direction to go in. Time to time, Lord, I struggle in making decisions. I need to know, Lord, some guidelines and some wisdom. And it all comes from your word, Lord. The word that you have written to us, Lord, that we would live by. As James said in 122, that we should be doers of the word. And that's every word. And continually doing the word of God in the Greek. And so, Lord... We need to view your word as precious to us, as life itself, Father, where we get our direction, Father, not from man, Lord, but from your word. And we pray, Lord, that we would be open to hear what your word has to say to us, Lord. And even though it may sound strange and hard and difficult, Lord, we need to be willing to receive it, Father. So help us to receive your word, Lord, with all sincerity and heart. And let it be our word to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so let's turn our Bibles to Numbers chapter 18. Because we are a Bible teaching church here. We love to go through the Bible. We're going through the Old Testament on Wednesday nights. And we're in Numbers. We just happen to be here. And it is a subject that's kind of difficult to teach. But you know what? I'm a Bible teacher. And as we go through the Bible, I teach the Bible. And I'm not... Uh, 
holding anything back. I just want us to understand what God has written down as we observe it, interpret it, and then apply it to our lives very clearly. So tonight we are in Numbers chapter 18, and we are going to look at the work and support of the Levites. The work and support of the Levites. What they were responsible in doing in the temple and who was responsible to do it, but also how God provided for the Levite priest who served in the temple. Uh, we want to have a, a well-balanced um, thought on how God supports those that are in ministry, those that are full-time, those that are pastors uh, in working in the work of the Lord, those that are missionaries out there in the mission field. They have a tough job, by the way, as I've uh, experienced that this past couple of weeks, and any others that um, are out there. So we want to look at the work and the support of the Levites. Now, I'm going to share with you a couple of things, and I hope that you don't get the I wrong idea uh, but about what I'm about to say, but this is the reality that pastors deal with and the reality of, of what pastors are compensated with in our culture today compared to back then. I think Solomon was probably the richest man at that time. They say that he was probably worth $18 billion uh, at that time, which is pretty rich. Probably almost as close as, if not better than the Getty, the Gettys who started the whole oil business, who is, who is the richest man in the world at this point, has ever been the richest man, was the Gettys. And if you've heard, if you ever heard his story and then his grandson being kidnapped for millions of dollars uh, and so. But let me read to you an article that just uh, was put out in September by Jeff Robinson. He said, the pastoral candidate, this is a pastor who was looking to be hired at a church, He's anxious, as he says. He doesn't want to ask because he doesn't want to come off as presumptuous or espouse a subtle prosperity theology, which is an error. How much are you willing to pay me, was his thought. In my first full-time ministry position, I waited until the church had elected me to even bring up the word salary. I was relieved when the figure they gave me was in the ballpark of what my family needed. And I find that interesting in this article, and I point that out because I believe that God provides pastors with what they need. Now, there are pastors who get more than what they need and have their wants also uh, taken care of, and we'll see that in a moment. But I think that God has called pastors to a place where their needs are met by the body of Christ. But saying that, let me continue on. But all admit to being squirmish, even fearful of the whole conversation, as I think good pastors are. They don't like to talk about money, compensation, and salaries, and so forth. And as a result of the unbiblical notion some churches have, that God will keep our pastor humble if we will keep him poor. And that's how people think. Our pastor should be poor. I've had people say that. I don't have anything. Why should you? You know, And that's sad that they have that mentality. Far too many pastors are grossly underpaid, according to his article. This creates anxiety that in turn can create burnout and eventually lead to some ungodly men to lead to some godly men to leave ministry so they can make a living uh, for their families. The significant portion of ministers are undercompensated. Yes. This is especially true in smaller churches, rural churches and bivocational ministries. And I find that to be true. That the churches that really struggle financially in supporting their pastors are the smaller churches. The bigger churches have no issues with it whatsoever. The National Association of Evangelicals did a study in 2015. 4,000 ministers nationwide and found that half make less than $50,000 a year. More than three and four knew someone who left ministry due to financial stress. Pastors may be able to pay their monthly bills, but they struggle to save for retirement or to pay down seminary debts and medical bills. And this is the reality of ministry, and one should consider when thinking of becoming a minister, because that is what you're walking into if you desire to be a minister. God's plan for ministers is perfect. It's God's children that are to support the pastor. Basic, basic and very simple and to the point. The context here that we're going to look at tonight, uh, since the entire tribe of Levite had been singled out to serve as priests, 
It was necessary to assign duties and responsibilities and to create a hierarchy within the group headed by Aaron himself, who was Moses' brother and Aaron's son. Therefore, Numbers 18 deals with the duties and the responsibilities of the priests. However, no one, no one other than Aaron and his sons uh, and their descendants were allowed to actually perform the sacrifices or minister uh, before the Ark of the Testimony. It was Aaron himself and only his sons, not the rest of the priests. We will also see God's plan for providing for the priest in this chapter. So if we were to break this chapter up, 32 verses... Verse 1 talks about the priests who are accountable uh, for the sanctuary and for the priesthood. Verse 2 through 7, we see the Levites are chosen by God uh, to help the priests in the ministries, at the altars, and at the tabernacle. So Aaron and his family were to do the work, but the other Levite priests were to help Aaron and his family to support them uh, to be second in their lives, in a sense. And then 8 through 20, the firstborn and the Devoted portion belonged to priests. And then 21 through 24, and actually to the rest of the chapter, is the tithes were to support the Levites. And even the Levites were, were to give tithes to the priests also. Three points tonight. The work of the priest, the Lord's provision, and the Lord's compensation. The work of the priest, which is always burdensome. The Lord's provision, which he always provides. And then the Lord's compensation, how he has provided that work. So let's look at the work of the priest, verse 1. Then the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear the iniquity related to the sanctuary. Now he's talking about the sacrifices of the children of Israel. And how they were to bear the burden of the sacrifices on a daily basis. As the people came to bring the lamb to be sacrificed for their sins. This was their call of God to bear that iniquity in the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear the iniquity associated with your priests. So the Lord clearly says to Aaron that he, his sons, and all his family will be held fully responsible for any offerings that are connected in conjunction with the sanctuary. That's his responsibility. They were accountable to God. Just as pastors today are in charge of the functioning of the church, the teaching of the church, uh, the leading of the church spiritually, and they are accountable to God and no one else. They're not accountable to men, though it's great to have accountability with men, and it's good to have a good board where you're accountable to men, a good eldership, a good deaconship that you're accountable to these men, but ultimately you stand accountable to God and God alone. And that should be encouraging for a pastor, but also for the people. That God will handle those things. We don't need to handle them. We don't need to try to intervene. We don't need to try to, to help God out. God has a, a way of doing those things, and we need to let Him do that completely. Verse 2, also bring with you your brethren of the tribe of Levites. Now, that was the other relatives and tribes of the Levites. He was to bring them, the tribes of your fathers that you may be joined with you, or, or that they may be joined with you, and serve you while you and your sons are with you before the tabernacle of witness. So Aaron himself was of the tribe of Levi, while only he and his descendants were given the priesthood. The whole tribe of Levi had a special calling to help Aaron and the priest. They were called to support him in the work. If you can only imagine at that time what Aaron must have gone through just to offer up sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. You're talking millions of people that are coming to this, the sanctuary there to offer up their sins and sacrifice. Aaron probably worked tirelessly every single day offering up these sacrifices. And it's encouraging that others would come along and help Aaron, maybe do some part. He had to take that sacrifice to the Lord, but maybe someone else came and brought the sacrifice instead of him going and getting the sacrifice. Someone else did a little a bit of their part and that part, and it just helped him so that he could go longer and stronger as he was serving the Lord. And it's like that today within the churches. The pastor can't do everything. And I know that people think that he should be doing everything because he's full-time. What else does he do besides teach on Sunday and Wednesday? 
You know, it's nice to have a job where you only teach on Sunday and Wednesdays, but they think that's it. The most of my work is not teaching. Most of my work is administration, running of this church, um, and all the various ministries that are involved, counseling, uh, marrying. There's a lot of other things that go, are, go on in this church. So, But notice that he said that they may be joined with you and serve you. So that is a ministry of love. And, and I know that in this church, I am grateful for those who have that ministry of love to help me and support me. My assistant, a deacon, and those in ministry that are here that hold up my arms in a sense so that I can continue to do what I do. That is so needed. Verse 3 says, They shall attend to your needs and all the needs of the tabernacle, but they shall not come near the article of the sanctuary and the altar, lest they die, they and you also. So they were limited, right? They were restricted. Now he's saying this, why? Because we just saw in the last two chapters, 17 and 16, this rebellion that began to come against Moses, right, with Korah. You remember reading the story of Korah and how Korah's told Moses, who do you think you are? I can teach just like you. I can lead the people just like you. I'm a man just like you. I can do everything you do. And maybe you ought to leave and let me be in charge. Um, and so, like the enemy, the devil himself, who said, I'll be like the most high God and sit upon the throne. So Korah did. And what did Moses do? He humbled himself and he prayed and he sought the Lord and said, Lord, you take care of this. And God opened up the earth and swallowed Korah. Because God called Moses. He didn't, got, he didn't call Moses because of his qualifications. He called him because he chose him to be the one to deliver the children of Israel. And that was it. He wasn't any more special than Korah. It's just that God called him. And then we see that in chapter 17 where the Levites were saying, well, who is Aaron? What makes him best that he should be the high priest? And they came against him also. And we have men like that. And I can say this to you here because you understand this and those that are listening on Facebook. Any time that your heart begins to get divided against leadership, the best thing for you to do is just leave quietly. If you cause division, it's going to follow you for the rest of your days and it's going, you're going to be known for those type of things. And God isn't going to bless that ministry Amen. that you think that you're having. It's not. He's just not. <clears throat> you may have a church. You may have a crowd. But... It's not of God or ordained by God because he didn't call you to that because you gain that through division. You gain that by other men's works. Thank God that he's not in the business of opening up earth anymore and swallowing you. So have, he has grace on you, but you need to be very careful. Verse four, they shall be joined with you and attend to the needs of the tabernacle of meeting for all the work of the tabernacle. But an outsider shall not come near you. And you shall attend to the duties of the sanctuary and the duties of the altar that there may be no more wrath on the children of Israel. Okay, so he's pointing back to those two chapters again. Look, just do your job. Do what I've called you to do, Aaron. Priest, stop trying to take Aaron's position and job. Just do what I've called you to do. Be faithful with those things that God has given to you. That's enough. And you really don't want the position of a pastor. You really don't want those, those places of leadership because they're very difficult and hard. Those of you that are in my leadership, and we've had these discussions, I've counseled with you and been ministered by you, but we all know that as soon as you take one of those positions, trials come. Mm -hmm. The enemy comes, and it's difficult. And I know that with my leadership, those that are really good leaders here in the church, they're under trials and, and attacks constantly. And the only thing that keeps them going is Jesus Christ because of their faithfulness to him and him alone, not because of me but to Jesus Christ alone. And I see that in them because they are hanging on to him and him alone, just as I'm hanging on to him right alongside them. And they know that, and we hang on to him together. It's a hard job, it's a hard task, and if you think that it's easy, you don't know anything about ministry. It's not easy at all. It is not for the faint-hearted. You have to have a hard shell. And we know of many men who, have succumbed to the enemy's wrath many times because of it. There's a, a family right now, his name is Bryson, he's in India. He went there to, to minister to a lot of pastors, brought in resources for them all. They busted him. 
we asked him some basic questions. Why are you here? Oh, I'm, uh, I'm here to you know visit friends. He goes, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. He's not going to deny that. Did you bring any money for, for these friends? Yes, I did. So they let him go through customs without checking him, and then they accused him of sneaking it in. So they kept him there in India, arrested him. That's the attack that they go under. So he's been now there in India since the time that I left for Africa a week before October 5th. So he can't leave the country at all. He's stuck there. And he has a daughter that's handicapped and he helps his wife take care of his daughter and he can't do that right now. That's the kind of work, and that's the kind of attack that that work gets because of the enemy. So it's not something that you just think, I can do that job just as well. I don't know if you'd want to. And if I had a... Uh, the opportunity, I'd, I'd let you try it just to see if you'd really want to check it out because it's not easy. But notice that point that there may be no more wrath on the children of Israel. And the reason there won't be any more wrath is because you're not trying to divide the church. You're not trying to take someone's position or place when God hasn't called you to that. Verse 6, Behold, I myself have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel. They are a gift to you, given by the Lord to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Isn't that beautiful? It, it, it's a gift that God has given to them. And these men are gifts to you, Aaron. So th that means you should be appreciative of them because it was a free gift to you. You didn't have to earn it or anything. I'm just giving this to you. And so I'm giving you these men to help you out. And we're to value those who the Lord sends to us and gives to us for service. It is a divine gift. And to those who join us in this battle that we go through is very helpful. And we should be very grateful for that. Verse 7, Therefore you and your sons with you shall attend to your priesthood for everything at the altar and behind the veil, and you shall serve. I give your priesthood to you as a gift for service, but the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. So, that is the work of the high priests and the priests. They are to serve within the temple, uh, the Lord first and foremost before anyone else as they serve the people by offering up their sacrifices, whether they're wave offerings, uh, whatever type of uh, love offerings, tithing, all of those things that, that are part of that ministry they are to take care of. Now, it is the Lord who provides the Lord's provision, verse 8 through 20. Now, we'll see here the, the Lord offers to Aaron a portion of the offerings that are to be sacrificed at the altar. Aaron is to basically share in the offerings. He gets his food and his resources from those who are giving up these offerings for their sins. And so the Lord is taking care of him in that way. <clears throat> Look at verse 8. The Lord spoke to Aaron. Here, I myself have also given you charge of my heave offering. All the holy gifts of the children of Israel. I've given them as a portion to you, Aaron, and your sons, as an ordinance forever. Now, the heave offerings were brought to God as part of the peace offering. We see that in Exodus 29, 28, Leviticus 7. They were peace offerings and heave offerings. Also with a Nazarite offering, Numbers 6, 20, and a thanksgiving offering. So it was part of the offerings that God uh, was given to by the people. In the heave offering, a choice portion of the animal, which was usually the breast or the thigh, was heaved or waved before the Lord, in, in a sense. So it, it was one of those offerings where you take it, and so here, Lord, here it is for you. Right? I'm bringing this to you, Lord. It, it wasn't one to show off what I'm bringing, you know, but it was one to say, Lord, I'm bringing it to you joyfully because you have called me to this. This is yours that I'm giving to you. And you get the sense what Paul was saying in Corinthians when he says, when you give, give hilariously. Give joyfully. Because the word joyfully there is, means hilariously in, in, the, in the Greek. And so when we give, we give hilariously. Lord, here it is. I'm waving it before you. Now be careful you're not waving it before anyone else. Because it's for the Lord only. The Bible does say, don't let your, your left hand know what your right hand is, is giving. So there's a sense where you have to you know, exercise self-control there and not want to be seen in doing that. I had a brother years ago, great, great brother, and I think he read this scripture and, and he, um, he was moved to 
to kind of mimic what they did there, but people just misunderstood it because uh, the way he was doing it, whenever the tithe and offerings were collected, he would literally take his envelope and he'd go like this, wave it before the Lord, <laughs> and then he would throw it into the, the um, tithe bag, you know? And there were several people like, what is he doing? Why is he waving his offering before the Lord, you know? So we had to ask him, you know, I think it's uh, confusing people. Because it almost seems like you're saying, look, I'm giving, so you better give. You know, motivating them to do something that maybe God hasn't touched their hearts yet to do. So he may have understood what the reason of doing it, but it just didn't seem to work. So we don't do that anymore because, what, Christ was our offering ultimate. We don't need to do that anymore. So he goes on and says, this shall be yours of the most holy things reserved from the fire. Every offering of theirs, every grain offering, and every sin offering... And every trespass offering which they render to me shall be most holy for you and your sons. So you see how God provided for the priest. They are to partake of the offerings of the people. They provided for them. Now we don't do that today. You know, I don't partake of uh, offerings because there are no offerings of animals whatsoever. We do have food afterwards, but I pay for it because I choose to pay for it. I, I don't want to just take something. I, I want to be an example uh, in, in when I participate with ministries and so forth. And there, there are those, I'm sure, that, well, I'm the pastor. I shouldn't pay for the men's uh, retreat. I shouldn't pay for the men's breakfast. I shouldn't pay for the men's luncheon. You know, I'm the pastor here. I live off of what's here, right? But I've chosen to rather not be a stumbling block. I'd rather pay so that I don't stumble anybody. He says, how come he's always getting things for free? And that's all the enemy needs is just a little little edge, you know, to get in there and then people start questioning, oh, this guy's in it just for the money. You know, I, I do that purposely. I choose to do those things so that I don't offend anyone. So this necessarily does not apply to us, but it can because sometimes people are very gracious and, and they will bless me from time to time with the gift and so forth. And I appreciate uh, their hearts uh, towards me. Verse 10. In a most holy place you shall eat it. Every male shall eat it. It shall be holy to you. This also is yours, the heave offering of their gift. With all the wave offerings of the children of Israel, I have given them to you and to your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat it. All the best of the oil, all the best of the new wine and the grain, their first fruits of which they offer to the Lord. I have given them to you. Whatever first ripe, first ripe fruit is in their land, which they bring to the Lord, shall be yours. Everyone who is clean in your house may eat of it. And, and that, to me, that makes practical sense because God isn't eating the food. You know, so they're bringing this abundance of food and they're offering it before God and it's sitting there, what? Rotting. Right, so why let it rot? Let's feed the priest, you know, and make sure that they're taken care of. I think that's practical sense there. And it's also taking care of the priests who are the ones working, which I'm sure there are a lot of priests working within the temple when you have that many people, over a million or so. So all that fruit won't go to waste, though it's an offering to the Lord. And the Lord's not going to let it just spoil because God doesn't eat or need to eat either. So it makes sense to me. Every devoted thing, verse 14, in Israel shall be yours. So anything that's devoted to the Lord, they got to partake of. That's how God provided. Everything that first opens the womb of all flesh, which they bring to the Lord. So even of their stock, their animals, if they had three animals, or let's say a bunch of kittens, because kittens have a lot of, of kittens, right? That mm -hmm. first one belongs to the Lord. And you would give that to the priest, and the priest would take that cow or that calf and so forth. Now, that was always a, a struggle with some. Because if you have a calf and they have one calf, guess what? You don't get a calf. <laughs> the Lord gets that calf. So you always want your calf to have two. Okay, Lord, here's yours, and here's mine. Reminds me of a story in a farmer who just was praying, Lord, please let there be two calves. Lord, please let there be two calves. I, I really need a calf, Lord, and, and your calf, is. I'm going to give it to you, Lord, so really, please, Lord. And he came out, and two calves were there, but one of them died, and he said, sorry, Lord, your calf died. 
<laughs> no, the live one goes to the Lord. I mean, but there's some truth to that, right? Because sometimes we as Christians, we want to give God our second best and not our first. And God deserves our first best. No matter what, He deserves our first. Our tithe goes to Him. And if we're going to donate something, you know, make sure it works. I don't know how many times we get stuff donated and it doesn't even work. So we end up having <laughs> to take it to the trash dump and so forth because they didn't want to take it to the trash themselves. And, and in their hearts, they're thinking, oh, look at what I'm giving. But you're not. It's junk. Come on. It's just junk. You're giving God junk. And God doesn't like junk. You, you want to give them your best. That's the kind of people that we should be. Always doing our best. Not our second best, but going all out. I believe God has called Christians to outdo the rest of the world. We're to work harder. We're to do things harder. We're to be extreme in those areas so that we shine, so that we can share the gospel with people. That's so important. And we should even give uh, more than others too. So every devoted thing shall be yours that opens the flesh, which the Lord brings, whether man or beast, shall be yours. Now why man? Because the firstborn was then given to the priesthood so they can serve in the temple. They didn't offer them up. They just served in the temple of the Lord with the rest of the priests. Nevertheless, the firstborn of men you shall surely redeem, and the firstborn of unclean animals you shall redeem. So you could redeem the man or even an animal where you gave uh, money instead. So if you don't want to give your son, let's just say that the firstborn was a son, and then the next one was a daughter. Well, your son's got to go into the temple. You could say, you know, I really need a son to plow my field, so how about if I redeem him by giving some money uh, to the priest? And so God allowed that to take place. You could do that. And those redeemed, verse 16, of the devoted things shall, you shall redeem when one, at one month old, according to the validation of four or five shekels of silver, according to the shekels of the sanctuary, which is 20 geras. So these were the monies that they used. They weren't necessarily coined. You get the idea of the Western days where they just had a little pouch and powdered gold dust, you know, they would weigh it out and give it to you, a couple of nuggets and so forth, that should cover it, and, and that's done. So this is how they took care of it at that time. But the firstborn of the cow, the firstborn of a sheep, or the firstborn of a goat, you shall not redeem. They are holy, you shall not sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire to the sweet aroma to the Lord. And their flesh shall be yours just as the wave breast and the right thigh are yours. All the heave offerings of the holy things which the children of Israel offer to the Lord. I have given to you and your sons and daughters with you as an ordinance forever. It is a covenant of salt forever before the Lord with you and your descendants with you. So we see the Lord's provision here and how God takes care of his children through the offerings of the people of God. All of these belong to the priest. And it was vitally important for the children of Israel to fulfill their obligations so that God could provide for the priest, right? If the children of Israel didn't provide their offerings unto the Lord, then the priest could not eat. Now notice, first of all, that the children of Israel had to provide their tithes, their offerings, their way, their peace. To who? To the Lord. And then the priests were to take of that. When we give, and this is, this is a good point here of application, when we give, we don't give to man. We don't give to leadership. We give to the Lord. This is where we have to be faithful and have faith in God. We're not giving to man. There are so many people that, that go to church, and Christians too. I know when I was in Catholicism, I thought this way. Whenever they passed the basket around, and usually church was so big, they, they'd actually have baskets with poles on the end of it. And the poles would they go, ooh, so you get way over there and pull it right back, you know? And I remember thinking, all I want is my money. So that priest could get richer. And, you know, not realizing he doesn't have anything. He lives in, you know, a home on the church property, you know, maybe drives a car around but doesn't have anything more than that. The church, the, the, the people that are getting rich are in the Vatican. <laughs> They're the ones that are getting rich. But that's how I thought. So I kind of just didn't want to look cheap. So I'd get a quarter and just kind of grab it like this, you know, psh, do this. So it makes me question people at times. When I see them do this, when they're giving, I'm thinking, they're, they're not giving nothing, you know? <laughs> Just my thought. I don't know why I even said that. 
<laughs> but, but I guess because I did that. Um, so what was my point? So when we give, we give to God, not to man. Because that's how I thought. I'm giving to this priest because he wants my money. No, I'm giving to God. And I have to have faith that God sees that offering and God will take care of that offering. And if there's somebody misusing that funds, and there have been in many, many cases, God is going to judge them. But you will still be rewarded for giving your offering to the Lord. And that's important to understand. We always give to the Lord above all things. Then the Lord said, verse 20, to Aaron, you shall have no inheritance in their land, nor shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the children of Israel. Now that's a great deal, I think. You don't get to own any land. Uh, you could probably live on the land and have a house on, the, on a land, piece of land, whether you rent it or someone gives you as part of their land, but you cannot own land. You own me. I am your portion. I should be enough. And I think that's a great deal, to actually have an intimate relationship and be uh, intimate with God as your inheritance. I think they got the better deal than having to deal with a house. Um, always a good deal to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is their provision by the Lord. They are taken care of. And notice again, it's by the people offering up their sacrifices and their offerings to the Lord. Now the compensation, as far as monetary compensation, third point here, verse 21. Behold, I have given the children of Levi the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So here he makes it very clear that the tithes, that is the money, the 10% that they gave to the Lord was the Levites. Now, how much of that was the Levites? And what were they to use it for? Well, they were to use it for the temple itself and for their own provisions. They didn't necessarily keep the whole 10% all to themselves, but they distributed among each other. And of course, they needed to maintain the, the sanctuary. And if it needed to be maintained, they would maintain it. There was a wall that was broken down and chipped away or graffiti. They'd have to go over there and buy whatever paint and resources and make sure that they fixed it. And the mortar and, you know, put new mortar and paint it and it's back. And they would use those resources for that. So I have given the children of Israel, the children of Levites, the tithe of Israel. So God commanded the tithe. A tithe is a giving of 10% of one's income uh, to be given to the Levites for their support. The tithe belonged to God. He says, I have given, so they are his to give. But he gives them to the Levites, right? They're gods. They're not ours, by the way. Malachi makes that very clear that the 10% that we have in our income is not ours, but the Lord's. Now, if we keep it, then we're using God's resources. Unbiblically, by the way, because we're keeping that 10%. Now, you might be someone that says, but we're not under the Old Testament anymore. We're under the New Testament, and we don't believe in tithing. The New Testament doesn't mention tithing. Yes, it does. Jesus talks about tithing. Talks about the religious leaders, how they tithe. How they'll actually religiously tithe of everything they have. Even if they were to purchase some cinnamon, and that's very difficult to do, or pepper or salt, they would take and count out 10% of it and say, this is yours, Lord. And they give it to the, to the priest to, to tithe. And God says, that's wonderful, and that's great, but you need to have grace and mercy also. And then he tells them, so don't stop doing that, but add grace and mercy. Because they were being judgmental on others who weren't tithing, for, who were not as religious as they were on that whole process. And God says, you need to have compassion on them. Now when you look at Paul, he talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, he talks about giving, and how when we give, if we give sparingly, we what? Reap sparingly. If we give abundantly, we reap bountifully. Now, doesn't that sound like the same language in Malachi? If you steal my tithes, what will I do? I won't let your vineyard grow. I'll make sure you don't get much. But if you give your tithes, then I'll make sure you have more than enough. So same language, same principle. Before even the law, Melchizedek was given 
Abraham gave to the Lord a 10% first. So it's a principle that still today, that is a biblical observation. Uh, anything other than that, they're not reading their texts accurately, especially in the Greek and comparing it. The Old Testament is not void, and that's the problem that we make sometimes. We say, well, Jesus died and fulfilled the Old Testament, so it's void. Not true. Ten Commandments, they still apply today, right? We're still to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, so it's not void. Oh, no, we don't have to do that. We're not living in the Old Testament. Yes, you do. Jesus even made it clear, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He summed up the whole ten in two. And he said, you fulfill the whole law when you do that. And if you look at those two, the first one deals with God. The second deals with people. Now, if you go to the Old Testament and look at the commandments, there's three and seven. The first three deal with God. We still keep those. We're not to use God's name in vain. If you're using God's name in vain, then you need to ask yourself why you're taking God's name and using it as a swear word. You shouldn't be doing that. Or keeping the Sabbath day holy. We still need to go to church. Maybe not on Sunday, but we still need to go to church. The Bible says that very clear. And so even the commandments towards the, uh, your brethren, still, you still not to steal. Oh, we're not under, we can steal now. We're not under the Old Testament. No, you're still not to steal. Very clear. So it still holds true today. And, and I think you need to consider this because I know some people struggle because of what has been said by pastors and teachers who don't understand the biblical text. And sometimes they're just teaching what they heard someone say instead of studying the scriptures uh, very clearly. The tithe belonged to God. It's God's and it's always been God's and it's still God's and he still needs it. And if anything, it all, it's all God's because he's given it to us. He's given us the strengths. When an Israelite was not giving their tithes, they were not robbing the Levites, guys. They were robbing God. Very clear. And they were robbing God, Malachi 3 8 through 10, because God received the tithe from the giver and he gave it to the Levites. Because again, they're giving to God. And then God told the Levites they could have some of that. It is also important to understand that tithing is not a principle dependent on the Messianic law. Hebrews 7, 5 through 9 explains tithing was practiced and honored by God before the law of Moses. And since the New Testament doesn't emphasize tithing, one might not be strict on it for Christians though some Christians do argue against tithing on the basis of self-interest, but since giving is to be proportional, we should be giving some percentage, and 10% is a great place to start. So in return for the work which they performed, because they were working, the priests were working in the temple, and it was laborious, and so God made sure that they were taken care of with the tithe. The tithes were also given by God to pay for the Levites, uh, not as a gift, by the way, it's to pay them. This they received as compensation, and not just a gift. Oh, here's a gift. In other words, you do work. If you don't do the work, you're not going to get the pay. And so they had to work. They needed to be doing something and not just studying all day and then come on Sunday and Wednesday. There's more to it than that. And unfortunately, there are a lot of pastors who do that especially in the mega churches. So I need to study all day long. I got a staff that does counseling. I got a staff that visits hospitals. I got a staff that does married. So I just really pretty, pretty much stay in my little house out by the beach and study. You know, I don't think that's biblical. I think God wants you to counsel. He wants you to um, use your wisdom to help other people too. You gotta have that balance. I mean, it's great that you can study uh, that way. Usually you're gifted because you're a great orator. You know, you just have a great way of commanding the words, and people ex enjoy that when someone can really express God's word in such a way that they're blown away, especially by their animations and various things like that. But the fact is, if they're not working in the ministry, they really shouldn't be compensated. It's to be compensation, because the Levites had dedicated themselves to the service of God and the people of God and the things of God, and it was right to be supported by God through the tithes of the children of Israel. The Levites had the right to expect to be supported through tithing. Paul presents the same principle in 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Yet it shows that when it was better for the gospel, the right, the right thing, he willingly laid it down. And see, that's the man of God's heart. Even though he understands that 
He should be getting paid by the ministry. If you labor by the ministry, you should be supported by the ministry. He even said it later on. Those of you that are ministered by the teacher, you should minister to them by your material things, the Bible says. But Paul said, I've chosen not to receive it because I don't want to be a stumbling block. And he did that with the Corinthians because it was a big deal with them. It was a big deal with them. And there are ministers that understand that. I know for the first 14 years of working in ministry, I did not receive anything. I just worked here and served here and did whatever I could to serve the Lord. And that just reveals a man's heart when they're willing to do that. Right? And there's many who are not. Well, I'm not even getting ministry unless they pay me and they take care of me. You know? And it just doesn't work like that. So God compensated them for their work, but they don't necessarily today need to take that. And I know some good pastor friends of mine that are still working and doing ministry at the same time. Hereafter, verse 22, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generation, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the, to the Levites as an inheritance." Therefore, I have said to them among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thus to the Levites, and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. So the Levites were to tithe. Mm. Now, don't misunderstand this. The priests were not literally to take the tithes. In other words... They had people that took the tithes and offerings, just like we do here in the church. The pastor shouldn't be touching the tithes and offerings. It should be other people taking care of that just because of accusations. And that's important, that you have set up some sort of accountability so that doesn't happen. I know in our church, we have people that collect it, people that put it in a place, and people that count it. And then we have other people, and not one person does everything either. It's too easy for someone to embezzle money that way. Then we have other people that just input. I don't input, but, but they input all the giving, so I don't see any of that. And then we have other people who pay bills, and then other people who input those kind of things. And of course, we still need other people <laughs> to help with that. Um, and so there are safeguards so that nothing uh, can be accused and everything is done rightly, and it just represents the Lord very clearly. So the tenth of the tithe. The Levites themselves were not exempt from tithing. They needed the tithe too. Uh, that's something that my pastor, Chuck, had um, ministered to me. And, of course, it's because it's in the scriptures that as pastors, we should tithe too. So we give 10% of what we get back into the ministry also. And your heave offering, verse 27, shall be reckoned to you as though it were a grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of winepress. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes, which you receive from the children of Israel. And you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. Of all your gifts, you shall offer up every heave offering to the Lord from the best of them and the consecrated part of it. From what part? The best of them, guys. That's just not me saying this. We should give the best to the Lord of all the gifts of the Lord. Therefore, verse 30, you shall say to them when you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted uh, to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor and as the produce of the winepress. And you shall eat it in any place, you and your household, for it is yours, your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall bear no sin because of it when you have lifted up the best of it, for you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel since you died. So it was to be received and honored and respected. Now, I just want to share something with you to close here. Um, it's wrong for a congregation to keep the pastor humble, you know, through poverty. And just as wrong for the pastor to be misusing the gifts of God to live above the people too. I think there's a balance there. I think the needs just need to be met in those ministries because I believe also that so many are misusing. I read this article and I thought I'd share it just to end here. 
and it's these uh, insanely, it's, it's titled, these are insanely rich religious leaders. This guy did his job. He found out what pastors are making. Not of small churches, because they're not making any money. They're barely making ends meet. They're struggling. There's 1,500 churches closing every month, probably, and mainly because of those reasons. But there are those mega churches, some of those churches that are more of motivational speakers. They're able to manipulate the English language and make you feel good about yourself and then, of course, give to them so that they can live their lives. And this guy put together a list. So I'm going to share some names and, and the cost here. You can get this on the Internet, so I'm not sharing anything that's not out there. You know, it's not something that I'm making making up here. Uh, it's by Carl DiMario, and this is, these are insanely rich religious leaders. Now, Al Sharpton, now I don't know if you know who Al Sharpton is, some of you may, I don't agree with his views at all, but for sake of just what they're worth, and that's the only point that I'm trying to make here, because he also lumps in some gurus that aren't even Christians, which makes no sense to me, so he gives you an idea where this guy's coming from, but as a minister, Al Sharpton makes $500,000 a year. Now, this income could be from book sales, from salaries, and you know that people give to him. Uh, there's some good pastors here, and there's some interesting pastors here, and there's some not so interesting. Uh, Charles Stanley, we all know who Charles Stanley is. Very open, uh, very gifted, uh, big ministry. I think he's worth it, but he makes $1.5 million. It's like, wow. Again, I think he's more than um, deserving of it and what he has done. Uh, and probably most of his resources come from his books that he has written. And it's not saying here how much they give back. I know my pastor Chuck, there was a point where he said, I don't even take a salary from the church. And I'm sure that he would take whatever he got and he gave it back to the kingdom of God because he was an investor in the kingdom of God. R.C. Scroll, if you don't know who he is, He's part of the um, Reformed theology of Calvinism, but he makes $2 million a year. <clears throat> I'm not going to even mention this guy. He's a guru. Chai Shin Noi. Interesting. Mark Driscoll. You may know him. There's some controversy over him, but he's $2.5 million. The N.T. Wright, $4 million. Let me get to the... Oh, here's another one. Jack Van Amp, used to love him. Prophecy updates, $2.5 million, according to Herald Weekly. Lewis Ferguson, again, this guy's listed in Fergon. He's part of the, uh, what is it, the um, black supremacist kind of you know, thing, and he makes $3 million from all of his people. Um, Tony Campolo, I used to love him. Great teacher, $4 million. Some of these you might not know. Joseph Prince. You ever hear Joseph Prince? Good teacher. Five million dollars that he makes. Paula White. And she is the president's friend. Uh, she's part of the wealth doctrine, that theology. She makes five million dollars as a preacher. Eddie Long, five million dollars. You might know who he is. Uh, no, no, uh, Noah Jones, five million dollars. Let me go down a little further. You know this person, Joyce Myers, $8 million. Uh, Juanita Bryan, $10 million. It gets, it gets even more. Okay, T.D. Jake. Who doesn't know T.D. Jake? Great speaker. Uh, his doctrine might be off in some areas, especially the Trinity, but he's a great speaker. $18 million that he makes. This one caught me by surprise. Remember... Uh, Growing Pains, the actor, Kurt Cameron, you know, and he gave that up for ministry, and now he's worth $20 million in ministry. That's amazing. That one caught me by surprise. Billy Graham, $25 million. So again, some of these guys I think are, are worth it. Uh, Rick Warren, $25 million. Benny Hinn, $60 million. He's part of the faith movement. So that's, I think, why it's a lot more. Joel Osteen, okay, I know you're waiting for that one. <laughs> A hundred million dollars. Wow. And I'm not saying this to put these people on the spot. I'm just telling you what's out there already. 
This is what they're getting paid. Okay, so it's not enough that Joel Olsey makes $100 million, but his wife, $100 million also. So that's $200 million for their household. Uh, let's see. Uh, the guy that just came out, uh, the rapper, Kanye West, Kanye West, or Kanye West, yeah, $240 million. And, and one billion says Business Insight. Ooh, I didn't see that one there. And of course, he just came out. So there's controversy over him. And some are supporting him, some are, some are saying, let's wait and see. I'm one that will say, let's wait and see. You know, as a pastor of a church, if someone comes in through the door, I don't know him, and they're like, yeah, I just received Christ, I'm excited. That's wonderful, but we're not just going to put you in the ministry. We're just not going to lift you up. And we're going to watch and wait and see how the Lord works in your life and, and show the evidence. This guy is immediately just there, and people are just like, wow, God's... One guy even said, there's a revival happening. Really? <laughs> I haven't seen a revival yet. You know, but it, it's that, that interesting. So keep an eye on, on what's going on. Kenneth Copeland, $300 million. You don't know who he is. George Foreman, I thought this was in here, but George Foreman's a pastor, right? $300 million. Um, let's see. And that is it. Now, of course, these are all pastors of mega churches, And so they have the resources to give their pastors that outrageous amount of, of money. And I do think it's an outrageous amount because a lot of these guys have mansions. There's no need for someone who doesn't have children and there's just two to have a mansion. It makes no sense to me. But they're going to stand before God. I can't judge them. That's what they're making. Um, but that's from the ministry. That's from the ministry. So I believe what the Bible says here, that God will provide for you what you need. And that's what he did for the um, priest. Could it be? I'm just suggesting, I don't know, it doesn't say, but could it be that God said, I don't want you to have an inheritance outside there? So could it be it's because they would have built themselves a mansion? You know? And so he says, no, you just stay here. You don't need a mansion, you don't need the material things, you don't need all that stuff. I will be your, I will be your provision. That is enough. So could it be? Just a point. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your precious word. And Lord, Ultimately, Father, we know that you are our provider, Father. <clears throat> and resources come from all over, Lord. And I thank you for that. I know from this church, Lord, not only from those that are here in this ministry, but people that have been here and that love this work have supported us um, regularly, Lord. They don't even live in California. And so, Lord, I know that it's you providing the resources for the work that you're doing here. And we just continue to lift up our ministry to you, Lord, and ask that you help us, Lord God, to just be above board, Lord, to represent, represent you even in this aspect, Father, as we serve you, Lord. Bless your precious people. I pray that they understand, Lord, their tithes, their offerings are to be given to you and you alone, Lord, and that you have given us the amount, and what we need to do is just trust you, Lord, trust you that you'll take care of. I think more than anything else, that is what God does not like. In fact, Hebrews says that without faith, you're unable to please God. And there's a lack of faith there if we're not giving our 10%. And it's not pleasing to Him. And it's the only place that He says that, that without faith, you're unable to please God. And then we see that in Malachi very clearly, you're robbing God. And so that's an area, Lord, that we really need to pray about and seek you, Lord. And just in our own minds know that it's done by faith. Not by feelings, not by emotions, not by the size of our checkbook, Lord, but by faith. Whether you make a hundred dollars, you give that ten, or whether you make a thousand, you give that hundred, Lord, because you're ultimately the one that provides for us. Lord. Bless your people, Lord. Encourage them. Let them see that they cannot outgive you, Father. That you will meet their every need. In yes. Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Thank you for coming out tonight. If we can have some of you, especially the guys, stick around, we're going to try to get all these chairs out of here and put them in the nursery so that we can get ready for tomorrow's event. Other than that, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.